So my name is Jennifer Began. I am the program coordinator for Impact on Education. We are the foundation for Boulder Valley Schools and we've been supporting the district since 1983. 31,000 students, over 4,000 educators. And this year, as you know, um, really threw everybody a curveball. Um, happy that we seem to be coming out of the tunnel and seeing the light. Um, but the needs, uh, present, past, and even future have really emerged um, greater than, than anyone could have expected. And so our needs and our purpose for existence has just become all that um, deeper. And um, that's our, our job is to promote equity in the district, to address student and school needs. And we are here for the long haul and we're, we're happy and really feel um, good about the work that, that we do and we couldn't do it without the community. So with that in mind, we have the What I Know Now video series and our students from our student advisory board are interviewing community leaders. And I'm going to leave it to Sarah and Jasper now. Sounds good. Okay, um, hello, I'm Sarah. I'm a junior at Boulder High. Um, and yeah, Jasper. <laughs> um, and I'm Jasper. I am a senior also at Boulder High School. Okay, so we're here today with our special guest, police, Boulder Police Chief Marius Harold, who has done exemplary work in community projects, police reform, and in contributing to big projects on reducing crime and improving services for those who are at risk. Chief Harold has also received numerous awards for her excellent work, such as the 2017 Goldman Herstein Award for Excellence in Problem-Oriented Policing. Okay, um, and so, uh, so what subject did you find most interesting at school and how has that moved forward with you in the rest of your life, especially around your work with uh, the police department? Well, that's a great question. Um, so my favorite classes were all, always, even in high school, um, sociology classes and theory classes, um, without a doubt, because it's formed the way I think about crime and disorder. Um, and I started my career out in social work. Um, and so I, I committed probably six to seven years, uh, both as a psychology intake worker um, and a social worker. I investigated uh, child abuse and sex assaults early on in my life. And I think with the theory classes, both at the college level and in high school, um, it kind of formed the way I look at um, underserved populations and the way I look at crime and disorder. So they were all very um, foundational uh, as I was coming up. Yeah, and so you mentioned you started as a social worker. Um, and so how do you think that has shaped the way that you've um, become a police chief as opposed to um, other people who sort of come in straight from high school or college and just live solely in the policing realm? How do you think starting as a social worker then moving into policing has sort of shaped, shifted that for you? Um, another great question. So. Um, I do have a unique perspective in policing, and I've always been different than most police leaders across the country. Um, and it really is because I've worked most of my adult life with uh, either disenfranchised uh, community members, um, vulnerable populations. Um, most certainly, uh, you know, Cincinnati is uh, a much more diverse uh, population than Boulder County and, or Colorado for that matter. Um, so I've, I've worked a lot with Appalachian populations. I've worked a lot with uh, black communities, um, brown communities. Um, I, I have a strong background in, in mental health too. Um, and, you know, just being part of, uh, I've worked both for the state of Kentucky um, and um, the county that surrounds Cincinnati. Um, and unfortunately, when you are looking at issues of poverty, um, lack of good schools, lack of education, um, you sure look at things differently than if you don't have that experience. And unfortunately with policing, um, 
you know, over the decades that I've been in policing, almost 30 years, policing attracts a certain type of mindset. And unfortunately, um, what I feel is we don't get very uh, well-rounded uh, people into policing to begin with. And it's been a flaw in policing. And that is just due to a lot of issues that I could probably talk about all day. Um, but the fact remains that Unfortunately, I continue to be unique in policing, um, but I do think that we need to think about backgrounds of uh, police officers that we recruit, recruit and retain. Um, but you know, it's a unique skill. Policing is a unique skill. Um, you have to be ambassadors to your community, um, but at the same time, as we saw at the King Supers, um, you have to be willing to die um, or take a life. And that combination of skill sets is very, very hard to get to. And unfortunately, um, at least throughout my career, um, that we have focused on more of the warrior skill set than we had the guardian skill set. Um, and I'm hoping part of the reform movement that we will be in for the next several decades will focus more on the guardian and ambassador skill set and customer service skill set and public servant skill set. Um, and problem solving, because really policing does come down to solving problems, which is a different mindset. It is a different set of skills. It is hard work, it's complex. And so um, I'm a big believer in education, which is another area of, you know, that I constantly harp on that I think police um, need at least a bachelor's degree and probably should have master's degrees um, because the work is very complex. Hope that answers your question, Jasper. Oh, far and beyond. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, okay. So as we know, there have been many issues across the country and even if in our own city with police brutality. What have you been doing in the department to work to alleviate the issues that we have been seeing? And what role do you think the Citizen Oversight Committee should play in this process? Thanks, Sarah. Well, uh, you know, the first thing I did when I came in is we changed our use of force policies, our citizens complaint policy, and we have a new police oversight monitor um, from Chicago and New York, um, very talented young man. His name is Joe Lapari. And so getting off with um, a good relationship with Mr. Lapari has been pivotal to my first year in this position. Um, obviously, he has recruited a, a diverse set of people to be an, an oversight panel, which they'll look at all citizens' complaints um, and make recommendations there. So all of that's good. The next thing, I really do believe that a few things um, really are critical to um, lessening the likelihood that we have this friction between community members and the police. One, you really have to change the use of force model. And that use of force model that historically um, has been problematic is, is really codified in a couple of big Supreme Court cases. And those are mostly, uh, the biggest court case is Graham v. Connor, which I, I really urge you both to take a look at because it lays the foundation of why and how the police can use force. Um, but I've always thought it's a little outdated. Um, so I've taken a use of force um, model from the United Kingdom um, and we've implemented here um, in Boulder. Um, there's other police departments across the country um, implementing this use of force policy, but um, it is a rare thing that we are taking policies from the United Kingdom um, and implementing here in the United States. But, you know, policing, all the principles of policing began in the United Kingdom. And unfortunately, over the decades, we've gotten so far away from Sir Robert Peel's um, fundamental work in policing. So those are two big areas that you should look at moving forward. One, Sir Robert Peel's um, principles of policing, which comes from England. Um, and that's where I am at. So I've changed the use of force policies. We have this new monitor. The other thing that we started when I got here, we did not have a devoted training section. So I have... Um, dedicated a really talented supervisor and four officers to maintain a constant 24 seven training cycle for the officers. Um, and that's critical um, because police just do not receive enough training. Um, and police receive their training usually 
through the Colorado State um, Policing Academy, which is really uh, minimal training and uh, it should not be allowed. We should be training on a constant basis. And then the third area um, that I've really prioritized is what type of people are we hiring? What type of people are we gonna retain? What type of people are we recruiting? So all of these things are very high priorities to me. Um, and then doing what I'm doing now is making sure that I'm engaged in the community at all levels so people know who I am and they trust me and they know that they can trust me to lead this organization through times of change. Yeah, I think that everything that you've said is really great, especially in these times where we really want to see farther reforms in the police department. Um, but do you mind just going very briefly over the principles of that you are borrowing from, um, from like the, was it England or, yeah. Yeah, so if you and go- are they different from the ones in the United States? Well, they're, 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 they're totally different in their style and their approach. Um, I won't go through all of Sir Robert Peel's, there's nine principles, but basically the biggest, the, the, the foundation of, how he felt about policing was that the police are no different than the community. We are the same. Um, in fact, um, if you're not working with the community um, on solving problems together, then it's really not policing at all. So the biggest principle that Peel really talked about was there should be no separation between the police and the community. We should be the same. And that we should take direction from the community on how they wanna be policed, what is their priorities. Um, and then, you know, whether anybody likes it or not, this is just the truth. And I know we're in a time of reform, but it's very important to understand that without the police and without that fabric being the same, you can't have a democracy. And if you look at any other country in the, in, the, in the world right now, the countries that do not have police departments do not have democracies. And so Peel felt that this was um, one of the biggest um, important uh, measurements that he could provide the police, that there has to be the community um, and, the, and the members of the community have to feel safe and they have to feel like there's somebody to provide protection. And if not, let me just ask you to that. You're smart, both of you. If we did not have a police department, who would be there to protect the vulnerable? And think about other countries that don't have police departments. Yeah, no one it. or the military. You're right there, Jasper. The, the military and what comes along with a military run country? What kind of leadership? Autocratic. Autocratic. That is that. The, you guys are smarter than my police department here. Um, and so th that's the main point is that policing is so important and it's too important to lose because what happens is, and I've seen this happen in other countries, um, and I can think of some that have just fallen in the last couple of years. If you get a dictator, and you have a military, you don't need police, but who your most vulnerable populations are then impacted. And so when I hear these cries for defunding the police, it really is much greater than people think it is um, because I would argue that without the police, unfortunately, it's the most vulnerable that we're all trying to protect that need the police the most. And so we have to get better, we have to do better, but at the end of the day, um, the rich will always have security, right? Uh, if you've ever been to South Africa, that pretty much what, what happens in South Africa. So the rich will always be protected. Um, it's the poor um, and the vulnerable and the people that are weaker than other people that need some level of protection. And I say, and so did Sir Robert Peel, the government's role, number one role is provide safety to the community. And so, this conversation is so important that we're having across the country because the police are pivotal to democracy. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Um, and so Boulder is often described as being in a bubble, right? 
Um, and so while you know there are some positive aspects to that bubble, oftentimes that comes with the negative drawback of we lack a lot of diversity that you see in a lot of other cities and counties. Um, and so what do you think we can do specifically within the police department to promote you know, more diversity um, within the city, but also within the department to try and, you know, not just have a bunch of white cops policing over a largely white city, but with some amount of minority. Well, I think, I think the more important thing is, is how do we get uh, diversity of perspectives? Um, and that to me becomes critical because I don't necessarily, and follow me on this, I don't necessarily mind if we have white males. What I need though are people that think differently about policing and people that understand the role of policing and the importance of policing and how fragile that relationship can be if we have horrible incidents that you see occurring across the country. So obviously I want diversity. I want different, different colors. I want, you know, I'm trying to recruit 30% female um, candidates because I know that they have uh, less likelihood that they're, they're going to engage in use of force situations and citizens complaints. So I want diversity, but I think more importantly um, for me, I want diversity of perspectives. I want people from different backgrounds, um, you know, different countries. I want people with different experiences. I want college educated people, or at least people from the military that have had these diverse um, interactions with people. So <clears throat> I think we have to think broader than what we're accustomed to. Um, because, you know, where I come from in Cincinnati, we have a very diverse police department, but bad things still happen. And so I think it's more important to focus on the diversity of perspectives. And I think that gets you to, um, sorry about that. Um, that gets you to, I think the heart of the issue is when we don't, we don't understand each other or we're not open-minded and we can't look at each other as humans. And that therein lies the problem in policing, I think sometimes. And then the other big thing that we never talk about is officer wellness. Um, it, it is a huge problem in policing, even in Boulder where we don't see the violence like in other cities. Um, we do see a lot of terrible things every day, all the, all the time. And so police officers, I think, are a lot of them are suffering from post-traumatic stress syndrome. Um, they don't get the care that they need. Um, we need a big officer wellness reform movement in this country as well. And we have to start looking at that like we do other um, high-risk uh, jobs. It's just policing historically. Nobody would take the help. You know, um, these guys are tough. They don't, they never act like they're fragile, but they're very fragile and they break and, um, we need to start looking at that because I think that's that's a big part of the problem that you see across the country when you see bad things happen. These police are, they're broken. They are broken. And uh, we need to look at that because they are part of the community. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think it was very interesting how you explained that um, diversity of perspective because, you know, being a different skin color doesn't automatically save you from, you know, engaging in, you know, police brutality, because it's just so important to, to change the mindset of, of people more so than focusing on skin color per se, because that's just not an exception. I agree with you, Sarah. In fact, most studies bear that out, that, um, you know, if, if you're not the dominant culture, usually you will go toward what the dominant culture is, is um, engaged in. And so, as you saw with the Derek Chauvin case, there was a lot of diversity there with those police officers. Yeah. But the yeah. dominant culture uh, usually wins out. Um, and so it's much more important to me to get people that think differently about policing. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> okay, so if you were able to craft a direction of the police force, how would you change its current situation? But we sort of kind of talked about that already. I think we're on a good path of reform in Boulder. Um, you know, my experience, it takes about five years to completely reform an agency, a smaller agency like this, it might take 10 years with a larger agency. 
because you're talking about a complete culture shift. Um, but the good, the good thing about Boulder is um, it's a very educated police department. Um, to be a supervisor, you have to have a bachelor's degree to, to, be on, to become a recruit. You have to have at least an AA degree. So we have a very educated police department. Um, I have doctors, I have lawyers, I have war heroes, uh, um, my professional standards uh, sergeant um, is a PhD in uh, bioscience. Um, you know, I have a, uh, a few attorneys. So this is a very educated police department, um, which sets us apart. And I know there's been some issues in the past, but uh, by and all, I'm, I'm very proud of the work. And, and we do have some diversity, um, not a ton, but we do have, we have more women um, than the majority of our benchmark cities across the United States. Uh, police departments are same size. <clears throat> we have um, Spanish speaking officers, which is awesome. Um, you know, we fall short on blacks, but it's very hard to recruit in Colorado for um, that demographic, but we are given it our best college shot and um, we'll just continue to try to get diversity of perspectives. I'm very interested in recruiting from other countries. Um, my professional standards supervisor is from Scotland. And uh, so he has a totally different perspective because they don't have guns. And so it's just refreshing to hear his perspectives on policing. So <clears throat> yeah, just keep keep working at it. Awesome, that sounds like a really great path to be in right now. Well, Absolutely. Thanks, I appreciate that. Yeah, um, and so one of the other uh, pieces that I think is getting phased out across the district is school resource officers. Mm -hmm. um, I know that Boulder High is losing our school resource officer within the next year or two. Um, and so what do you think about that, that role? Is it something that you think has been helpful? Is it something that you think isn't serving the role that it was intended? What do you think about the phasing out of the school resource officers? Well, I tell you the absolute truth. Um, when, I, when I first got here, I was amazed that we had school resource officers in, in the Boulder County area. Um, and I, I, you know, I don't know. I, you know, we just had this active shooter situation um, and that's a very scary situation. I don't know if having a police officer there would, would help. Um, it, it's just so hard to tell. Um, I know that in big urban environments like Cincinnati, where we have a lot of gun violence in the high schools, um, without the police, I think it's been voted every year to have the police there um, because there's so much gun violence within the school and people bring in guns to school and there's a lot of gang uh, activity in the schools, in the high schools. Um, and I think it would be hard pressed to take the police out of those uh, schools. Um, but that's, a, you know, the, in those big urban environments, that's exactly uh, the locations that they say there's this pipeline from school to, to jail. Um, I can tell you that the data in Boulder County did not support that. Um, in fact, it was rare that police ever self-initiated um, arrest. And so I leave that up to the school districts. I most certainly, I think that if we do, they should be paid positions by the school district. That was not occurring in Boulder County. Um, but I, I really believe that should be a decision by the schools and the parents. Um, and uh, I think it's needed, desperately needed in some areas where students and teacher safety would be at risk. Uh, I think in Boulder, it's more of a um, uh, concerns about uh, active shooters and so forth. Um, but I have to tell you, I have not talked to one teacher or one student who has told me that the police that were from Boulder City were not doing a really good job in the schools. Um, in fact, I just talked to Columbine, uh, I guess that is, that's an elementary and middle school or is that, yeah. Um, you know, they said they had great experiences and, and now they're looking for ways to bolster the relationship back because they felt that the police kept uh, the students out of the uh, criminal justice system. So very complicated issue and I have to leave those decisions to the parents and, and the school district uh, because I, I do think there's needs in some areas and not not the other. The other thing is that I haven't mentioned, that's the biggest part of policing that's often neglected. In this case, I think it is, 
is having accurate data and understanding we should all be evidence-based. We should all know what we're doing has the proper outcomes. And in policing, we neglect that. And so when accusations are, are kind of thrown at us, a lot of times we don't have good data to support um, what we need to do. But again, interesting topic. I, I leave it up to the parents and the schools. Do you want the police in there or not? Yeah, thank you. That was a very refreshing perspective. And I hadn't realized that they weren't paid positions. That's surprising. I can't quite believe that. Um, it's astonishing. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then hey, Vance, last... I'll tell you after Jasper. That's okay. <laughs> you can go. No, no, no. I was just going to say Chief Harold is absolutely, yeah, yeah she's obviously correct. Um, they're, they've been employees of the, of the police department and they just, their place of, of work is the schools, but the school district has not paid for them in the past. Hmm. Interesting. Good to know. Yep. Wow. Okay, so our last question is regarding sexual assault because I know that you've been involved in that um, department. Okay. Um, so I was just wondering what are some tools that you recommend that the community can use or implement to educate others regarding this sensitive topic? Because um, like for me in my school, we don't really talk about it or especially in health class, um, I feel like it often gets overlooked and yeah, so what are some tools that you, you recommend? Hmm. Well, this is a very uh, controversial topic. I just came from a university setting where um, there was a lot of dialogue on, on what, what we should be, um, you know, I guess the, the lesson plan around this topic. But I'm always really transparent. Um, I think if this is something that you're interested in, that you should have one of our sexual assault investigators come out and talk to the school and to, to a group of people. Um, you know, that a lot of the, I am so sorry. Um, here, here's, what, here's what we know. Um, I think a lot of situations can be prevented um, through education and training. Um, and I think that should be for everybody, right? And I always, I thought was very balanced at the university um, doing training and prevention for um, our males and our females on the uh, college campus. And I think we did a really good job balancing that messaging out because I most certainly don't want to victim blame um, uh, victims of a sexual assault. But I think there's a lot of information that we can understand and try to prevent. Um, and so if you're interested in that topic, um, we most certainly could put a curriculum together. Um, and there are, a, there's a ton of research out there on this topic. Um, and I think there's a ton that we can all do to prevent these types of assaults from occurring. Um, but it is a very sensitive uh, topic um, across the country. Um, but, you know, I think there needs to be a lot of training with our our male counterparts as well. And I think that um, we've been very successful in the past looking at those issues. But I think there's a lot we can do prevention wise. Um, there's a lot we can do with just training bystanders who see uh, behavior that's not um, acceptable to intervene. Um, the same thing that we would, you know, we would expect everybody, the good community members to do is intervene when we see bad things happening or potentially bad things happening. So. Um, let me know if you're interested in that, but there is a ton of research, um, especially out of the University of Cincinnati on this topic and what we can all do to prevent it. I'm just going to jump in and say, Chief Harold, we will be looking to you next year. <laughs> 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 because I, I um, you know, Jasper's graduating, but Sarah um, will hopefully be rejoining us at a student advisory board. And I could see this being yeah. <laughs> an initiative that, um, that we take up. Um, I, I, we're gonna try and get back to being more initiative driven this year kind of threw us oh. off because of mm -hmm. everything. But um, this has definitely been presented, this issue has been presented as um, one of great concern among our students. And um, yeah, I, 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 I personally uh, love your suggestion. So that yeah. could happen, I'm just saying. There's a lot to it, and most certainly, um, you know, uh, 
I'm a big believer that opportunity creates uh, is the number one reason we have crime and disorder is, is an opportunity structure. And so obviously if you have an opportunity structure you can prevent and you understand the better outcomes that you're gonna have. And so, yeah, we could most certainly put something together and you guys know where I live. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much. I really, really enjoy learning more about, you know, policing and reforms and yeah, it's great. <laughs> Absolutely. This has been a very enlightening conversation um, and has offered oh. some very interesting, refreshing perspectives. Yeah, I feel like I, I learned a lot. It before. Well, good. Well, listen, I can tell you're bright. And uh, anytime you want to come by the police department, walk around, do a ride along, anything like that, let me know. Um, hang out. Uh, meet, meet the guy from Scotland who has a funny accent. Uh, <laughs> we can make it happen. Thank you, Thank you so, so much. much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chief Harold. All right, guys. I hope you have a good day. You Thanks. too. You too. You too. Bye. Bye.